People think that equity-mindedness, some people think it's about fairness. We gotta treat everybody right. the same, this has right. to be fair, right. right? That is not what we're talking right. about. Equity in diversity, equity, and inclusion right. is treating people differently yes. to provide them what they need to exactly. succeed. Each and every classroom space, each and every office space, each and every corner of the university should be a place where all of us can say, I belong. We belong when we find our needs being met. That is equity. That is the call of each of us as educators. That's our call as parents, our call as citizens, our call uh, as human beings. recently shared how creating a sense of belonging is your theme for this academic school year. So, so what does this involve and how do you see faculty, staff, and students helping to support this type of effort? Yeah, thanks for that question, Levon. I, um, I think that belonging is essential for each and every person um, at Purdue and beyond, right? Uh, it's the uh, essential human need. Uh, to feel connected to something. To me, belonging asks three fundamental questions. The first is, do I feel like I belong? Uh, an intrinsic feeling. Uh, the second one is, do I see the fullness of my potential coming into being here? Can I, can I get to where I'm supposed to be from this place? And the third one is, am I supported or nurtured uh, to get to that potential? So who's got my back, right? Everyone here should be able to say, um, I feel like I belong. I see the fullness of my potential coming into being here. And there are people who uh, support and nurture me to reach that potential. That's the goal. Um, I would also add that when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and we ask, what is the real goal uh, of uh, these things, right? Um, a heightened sense of belonging, uh, I think, would be one of those goals. So I, mean, I appreciate that response. So how do you, in your role, how you measure or determine whether or not faculty, staff, and students feel as though they belong? How, how would, because I imagine there are folks that would be interested in knowing that. Sure. There are belonging measurements. So uh, a measurement is coming out uh, by uh, teaching and learning, uh, undergraduate education, to measure the belonging of undergraduate students. We'll expand that. Uh, along as well. Um, there are uh, efforts in inclusive advising uh, that will be happened to, uh, and we can measure a student's sense of belonging through the advisement uh, that they get and how they feel. Um, we have just launched an inclusive uh, appre appreciative inquiry uh, analysis to ask uh, black bowler makers in particular, uh, faculty, staff, and students, uh, how they feel a sense of belonging or connectedness mm -hmm. to the university. Um, so a number of, of measures. Uh, we also have the coach surveys that, uh, okay. that occur uh, for faculty, the CIRU data. And so some of this will be measured over the course of time as well. Okay, good, I appreciate that. So um, t thinking about in terms of culture and climate, so what has experience taught you about effectively changing culture and climate within higher education institutions, particularly related to equitable treatment and a sense of belonging? Yeah. One thing that I've learned is that an institution has to be intentional about the work. It is uh, nice to say that uh, we are equitable. Uh, it is much more difficult to do the self-interrogation uh, to ensure that that is in fact the case. So change can be difficult. Um, I have always or consistently said um, in my more mature life that the way one changes an institution is through love uh, rather than um, uh, hate or antipathy, right? Um, that people need to be able to hear you um, and uh, to find a reasoned place uh, to move forward, right? So often when we, um, we fail to hear each other, when we fail to engage people uh, in a sense of collective understanding, collective decision making, uh, those kinds of things, I think um, we hold onto the values of the institution. It's one thing that I would like to see happen more at Purdue. We have some very strong institutional values that can lead us forward. Um, our values uh, are honor. Um, integrity, 
uh, inclusion, uh, respect, mm -hmm. uh, growth, innovation, right? Um, those things can hold us together uh, in the midst of difficult and interesting change. With regard to DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, what I find is that, and what I found in coming here, was that there are many, many people who are really committed uh, to the work, uh, who are themselves change agents, and uh, who didn't find necessarily um, uh, a receptivity um, uh, from uh, the university generally, right? Um, I hope that is beginning to change. Um, one of the first elements of change that I tried to introduce here was um, for us to stop deficit framing um, blackness, right. for instance, right? Look at stories uh, that associate with uh, black bull and makers and it, all true stories of overcoming uh, difficulties, but difficult to find stories about um, black scholarship, black research, uh, research done by black scholars and the like. There was a need to asset frame who we are. Likewise, I try to asset frame the university uh, in change management, right? It's easy to deficit frame the university for what we haven't done. Right. Uh, I try to remind the university of what we have done, what our founding history is and why we should do uh, things more or differently. Um, that uh, can be compelling, mm -hmm. right? Another way to help change institutions is by calling forward uh, to our realities the needs of uh, our employers, um, right? We are producing a workforce for the nation and for the world. Mm -hmm. Our employers have expectations that uh, we deliver um, students, uh, workers, um, with certain competencies. We need to practice those competencies. Mm -hmm ourselves. Uh, we now have um, uh, new requirements by the federal government to evidence our, um, our success uh, and our efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those, uh, those requirements can be uh, pillars for change uh, at an institution as well. And then some change needs to uh, bubble up from the ground. Uh, there is still and always will be a need for uh, collective and self-advocacy um, and to uh, hear the voices of those folks who, uh, whose voices have not been heard as well. Uh, and so change comes <clears throat> in a number of ways, uh, but it should come. Yeah. So, of course, you're familiar with uh, the University Innovation Alliance and Purdue being a member. So, of course, you know, they also, UIA has a focus on supporting the needs of first generation students. So can you share how your office supports this focus area, that is the focus on first gen students? Sure. We're very much part of the week celebration, uh, although we don't have responsibility for first gen initiatives directly. Um, each of the cultural centers supports first generation students. The cultural centers, uh, Latinx, Black, uh, LGBTQ uh, plus uh, the Asian and Asian American and the Native American and cultural centers all have um, first generation students that they support. Moreover, we have a couple of important programs, the Emerging Leaders Scholars Program, uh, which is fairly heavily populated with first generation students, uh, as well as the LSAM program around research that often provides uh, underrepresented minority students uh, and first generation students with their first first real access points to doing uh, research in universities or outside of that. So we're deeply involved all around. Uh, another important thing, I think, uh, is that we've done significant research uh, on the success trajectories of every population of student at Purdue uh, over a 10-year period, including first-generation students. So we are able to uh, see and track the success trajectories of first-gen students, hiccups uh, in various uh, courses that are systematic, right? Um, uh, even down to uh, where uh, the best living accommodation
accommodations are uh, to support a higher level GPA, right? Um, so there's lots of data. The institution, Purdue, uh, recently took on first generation as in, uh, students as a mm. university level initiative. Okay. And I think that's within the last two or three years, uh, actually. Uh, so we have some work to do. Um, the efforts are highly localized. Um, and uh, at the same time, the university uh, is putting its arms around first gen as a population. Okay. Of course, you're familiar also with the Purdue Polytechnic High Schools. Um, so based on your observations, you know, as long as you've been here now at Purdue, what do you think Purdue's colleges uh, can do to better support the PPHS, the high schools, as well as students who matriculate from the high schools to Purdue University? Yeah, important question that I may frame a little bit differently or apply to, uh, reply to a little bit differently. The whole university, every college has opened its doors widely to Purdue Polytechnic High School students. Um, my office is engaged with them deeply as well, and they are wonderful young people coming to Purdue. Um, I am fairly positive that the necessary support systems and nurturing systems either have been put in place or are being put in place um, now across the university. One of the things that we can best do is to help Purdue Polytechnic high schools um, uh, best prepare the students uh, for life at Purdue, uh, for the rigors of our curriculum, uh, for the um, uh, change in environment. And we began that uh, over the summers with Polytechnic high school students. We have uh, a number of one week, one credit programs that we invite um, uh, the underclassmen uh, to, 9th, 10th, uh, and 11th graders. We have um, a summer pre-entry program uh, that we invite all accepted or admitted uh, Polytechnic high school students to attend, uh, where they are engaged in coursework and earning their first credits uh, up to nine credit hours, um, engaged in a learning community, uh, um, as well as uh, uh, supportive activities. So that part is happening. Uh, we also work with the high schools themselves through recruitment uh, and the like. We speak with parents. I think parent engagement is important. One of the things that we might consider and that I have um, heard people begin to talk about is in educating Purdue Polytechnic High School students, invite the entire family to be educated. Right. Uh, what are we doing for the parents uh, to support their educational right. nurturing? Right. Um, right. We expect a great deal of parents, uh, many of whom have not gone to college, right. right, and may not have access to some of the uh, the resources uh, and not including knowledge. Uh, that's uh, really important. Um, finding a way for the parents to become intimately involved in learning and growth as uh, human, human beings themselves, as individuals themselves, along with their students, uh, might be one of the best ways that we can support uh, the Polytechnic High School students going forward as well. So, you know, you and I have talked about this topic uh, many times, um, which is this notion of increasing faculty diversity. So. Uh, as you know, increasing faculty diversity has been something of a struggle in all of our colleges and for that matter across the United States yeah. of the institutions. Can you talk for a moment about plans you have in place to address this issue? Sure, yeah. sure. So many people may know that uh, after the murder of George Floyd, mm -hmm. uh, Purdue University, a number of universities and corporations uh, uh, took a look at the state of black uh, participation, uh, engagement, uh, and success. Um, we did as well. The Board of Trustees uh, called forward an equity task force mm -hmm. to look at the black boiler maker uh, experience and asked us to do a number of things uh, as a university over the next five years. I think the horizon is going to be longer than five right. years because right. these things take some time. Um, among those things is to increase uh, black faculty uh, numbers. We uh, have a faculty, blacks represent about 2.8% uh, of the faculty at Purdue. Um, uh, and to put that in some raw numbers, mm -hmm. right? Um, we think of tenure and tenure track right. faculty, so right. those that have, um, you know, relatively permanent position, right? right. right? Um, in, I believe it was two. 
2000, year 2021, something like that, perhaps 21, we had 1,919 uh, tenured and tenured track faculty okay. at Purdue. Of that number, 59 were black, right? And so we're talking very small numbers. We introduced uh, through the equity task force a, uh, a number of cluster hires um, that we hope will help to diversify the faculty more, uh, black and others. Um, the first cluster uh, was in public health, health equity, and health policy. There were 14 lines. Um, uh, we have filled uh, 11 of those lines, and I'm happy to say that a number of uh, black uh, leading scholars will be joining or have joined Purdue this right. year. So that's one thing. We have uh, a uh, series of three cluster hires that will happen. One happened last year. Uh, there is a cluster hire happening this year, and there'll be another one next year. So 40 lines, uh, that is actually academic positions uh, dedicated to that. Um, I hope and assume uh, that a number of those folks will be of diverse background. So that's one thing. I think the most positive thing that I can say, though, is that our conversations with the faculty across Purdue and all colleges over the past few years is yielding some really good results. Um, we hired at least as many black faculty outside of the cluster uh, searches uh, as we did uh, in the cluster this year. That is a record. Um, so things are looking up. We have to have the intentionality. What we've discovered, Levon, is that with intentionality, um, people gather right. uh, and they come uh, to the table, right? Um, absent that intentionality, um, people often scatter. Um, we need the gathering. Yeah. yeah. Good. So similar to that question, uh, and this is something that I've noticed in my career that we often don't talk enough about, but how can we address issues related to improving our staff diversity? Yeah, tough issue here and everywhere. Um, too little focus has been placed on staff, yeah. right? Yes. Um, uh, if we... Uh, you know, there is usually a focus on students and faculty, right, right. those that uh, learn and those that teach. Yeah. Uh, staff are the people that help make the entire yes. operation work. Right. Uh, again, through the Equity Task Force, um, there's a focus on black staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the Office of Human Resources has put together a new mentoring, professional development mm -hmm. mentoring program called Develop Me 2.0, where it has invited uh, principally black, but all staff, um, to uh, have their uh, careers co-developed mm -hmm. uh, with them. Uh, that's an important thing around professional growth uh, and uh, giving people a reason to want to stay, right. uh, frankly. There has also been the hiring of a diversity recruiter uh, in HR. Uh, so the first we've had that we know of in an official capacity, and uh, it has yielded good results as well. I'm happy to say that uh, four leading um, uh, administrators uh, have joined Purdue this year who are African American or black. Mm -hmm. um, so the head of uh, PUSH, the mm -hmm. Purdue University yeah. Health System, yeah. uh, is black. Um, the uh, deputy athletics director, yes. Um, yes. who has, you know, real significance in the sports world, yes. uh, particularly the NFL, yeah. uh, is here. Phenomenal She's woman. Phenomenal woman. Phenomenal <laughs> woman indeed. Yes. Uh, and a boiler maker, yeah. right, uh, has returned. Yes. Um, the new director of, uh, uh, for security of PARI, the Purdue Applied uh, Research uh, Center, mm -hmm. um, really covers our um, most um, uh, top secret uh, and other technologies right. um, is here. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a background coming from uh, uh, the White House mm -hmm. um, and other spaces, uh, so he handles our security clearances. Um, and there are others, mm -hmm. right? So we see growth happening. Yeah. We have uh, this year uh, gone from 2.8% black mm -hmm. staff uh, to 3% mm -hmm. black staff. We can see material movement right. there. Um, and we have introduced 
the ability to work virtually. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we expect to have people in Indianapolis and Chicago and uh, maybe even in California, mm -hmm. uh, who knows, working for Purdue. So the aperture uh, for uh, working here is uh, open more broadly, mm -hmm. uh, and we hope that that will benefit diversity. Yeah. So how do you help create an ethos of equity mindedness within departments and colleges? Yeah, so the first thing, and perhaps the main thing is helping people understand what equity mindedness right. is, right? right? Uh, people think that equity mindedness, some people think it's about fairness, right? right? right. Um, and I'm a faculty member, I've got a big class, I've got to treat everybody right. the same, this has right. to be fair, right. 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 right? That is not what we're talking right. about. Right. Equity in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right is providing people what they need to succeed right. and in fact treating people differently yes. to provide them what they need to exactly. succeed well how on earth can i do that right, right? well we do it every day yeah. levon right um you're a father yes. uh you have uh more than one daughter yes right you love them all the same right but they're different people yeah and you provide each of them what they need in order to thrive. That yeah. is what we do as parents, exactly. as human beings. Yeah. We all deserve to have our needs met in that regard, whether they are our educational needs, our mm -hmm. social needs, uh, our humanity needs, mm -hmm. right? Um, and as an institution, we should dare not welcome, invite and welcome um, 50,000 students whose needs we cannot provide. Mm -hmm. So it is something that we do innately in our lives every day. We can do the same thing in our classrooms uh, every day. Look at students and as, co as colleagues as well, as individuals, uh, as human beings. There are some needs that we share um, <clears throat> due to our collective social experience. Um, and there's some needs that we do not share. Each and every classroom space, each and every office space, uh, each and every corner of the university should be a place where all of us can say, I belong, right? We belong when we find our needs being met. That is equity. That is the call of uh, each of us as educators that's our call as parents, our call as citizens, our call uh, as human beings. What advice would you give or how would you counsel faculty and staff who say, John, you know, this, this notion that you offer up on equity mining is it's too much work to try to meet the needs of 30 different individuals of a classroom. That's too much work. How would you respond to something like that? Because the person may not just know. Right, right. Well. We don't need to take equity outside of the domain in which we are responsible. So it's equity in learning, mm -hmm. equity in classroom participation, right? right? Um, who's engaged and who's not engaged, right? right? Um, who is uh, doing well on exams, who uh, perhaps needs more support mm -hmm. uh, in exams um, to bring their scores up? Um, who do we nurture, right, right, right. Uh, in the classroom? Who do we say you can do it uh, uh, versus uh, not? Uh, equity is a collective responsibility. It's also an individual responsibility. There is uh, a requirement of the student or of uh, the person who needs equity to state what their needs are right. as exactly. well. So we need to invite students to tell us uh, what they need within the context of the classroom and of the work we are doing. And we need to offer them uh, the, um, the kind of schedule, the framework, right. uh, by which to have their needs met. And if there are things that uh, they need that aren't uh, prescripted, mm -hmm. uh, then they have an obligation uh, to tell us. Um, we then have uh, the obligation to try to meet those needs where we find them to be reasonable uh, and within our purview. We cannot be all things to all people, right. but we must be all things that are necessary within the work we do 
for the people we serve. We have that human capacity. May require us to think a little bit differently, right? right? Um, In order to function a little bit differently. Um, May require us to listen more, right? Then speak less. Um, It may require us to observe, Mm -hmm. right? Often we can uh, tell where there might be a need simply yeah. by observing. Right. Um, and then there's always the need for an invitation, mm-hmm. right? Um, to make it okay to say, this is what I need. Um, and then to offer that to the student or the, uh, the other person mm-hmm. uh, and to say, here's your responsibility right. in meeting that need for yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what are the key strategies that work best when encouraging buy-in from colleges when you roll out new diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives? And I guess the second part to that is, what difficulties do you run into uh, most often? There is a fundamental question that must be asked and answered uh, in getting buy-in from colleges, central diversity, or any initiative. What's in it for me? (laughs) Right. What's in it for me? Right. 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 My belief is that in diversity, equity, and inclusion, our job is to support the colleges, um, which really have most of the hands-on, on-the-ground experience and responsibility uh, in working with uh, students, faculty, and staff, right? Uh, So we should be a supportive measure uh, for colleges. That's one thing. We should add value. Uh, to what's happening in the colleges, and we should be um, able to uh, kind of unite uh, things across the universities, so to add a sense of cohesion and purpose. Um, When those things are operating together, uh, we have the beginnings of a win. Um, uh, It's also important uh, to be able to develop uh, or deliver resources Mm -hmm. um, to the initiatives that one asks uh, colleges to engage in uh, because resources are frankly so tight and we ask so very much of the colleges. Those things are important. And then we need to uh, demonstrate how what we are asking uh, has the possibility of lifting um, either populations within the university or the entire university Mm -hmm. uh, collective. It's the idea that we are stronger together uh, than we are apart. Um, uh, I very much appreciate the individuality of every college, the autonomy of every college, and also recognize that there are some things that um, are just bigger than in the individual college that we need uh, to do. And that's where I think the associate deans for diversity and inclusion group, the group that you're on, uh, become so very, very important in helping us uh, to develop the wherewithal to meet the needs of the colleges uh, and the university as a whole. So to what extent, I know myself and others uh, think about this notion of peer comparison. So to what extent do you rely on peer comparisons in your line of work? And then secondarily, what are some things you learn when comparing progress in diversity, equity, and inclusion with our peers? I rely on uh, peer comparisons a lot and very little at the same time. Most of our peer comparisons would be the Big Ten. And uh, um, by and large, um, we're in the middle of a pretty bad bunch uh, in terms of DEI outcomes, uh, right? Um, there are a couple of institutions that are outliers um, in the Northeast, right? So you've got Rutgers uh, that is uh, an outlier and perhaps one or two others. But for the most part, those of us that are in the Midwest uh, are um, uh, not excelling at the level that I would hope that we do. Now, that said, Universities in um, the Northeast and the uh, uh, and, and the West Coast aren't excelling very well either, right, right, right? right? So if you look at us, we are pretty much in the middle, except in a couple of cases, uh, the bottom third, right? right? So if you look at black faculty right, right. numbers, the yeah, bottom yeah, third, yeah, yeah. right? So we're comparing ourselves uh, to um, a pretty dull bunch. Okay. What I would like to compare ourselves to is our own value proposition and uh, possibility, 
right? Um, building they will come as anathema uh, right. in the black community, right? right? right. Building we ain't coming um, <laughs> unless there's a good value proposition, right. including an invitation, exactly. right? Uh, and perhaps multiple invitations. Purdue has a rich story and rich possibilities uh, in DEI. We have a solid enough value proposition that if we really honed that value proposition, told the story and invited people in, if we did the work of providing equity, um, which is a lot has to do, it's a lot related to uh, our environment, mm -hmm. to make it a more welcoming place, yeah, right, right. Um, people will come, yeah. right? People ask me, you know, why would black people come to the middle of Indiana and these corn and soybean fields? And I say, you know, these are some of the um, uh, most well-educated corn and soybean fields in, in the world, right? Um, the question is not why would they, but why wouldn't they, right? I like to tell the story um, that when I think about black folk, right, in Purdue, Purdue has been uh, a champion, uh, a quiet champion of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion for over 120 years. Um, if people knew the richness of that, right? We were founded in 1869, mm -hmm. right? Shortly after the Civil War. Um, same time as most HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. We graduated our first black student in 1890. College of Pharmacy, second one, 1894, College of Engineering. Then came 1896 in Plessy versus Ferguson. We actively recruited blacks into our undergraduate and graduate programs throughout the 100 years of segregation. Founding home of the National Society of Black Engineers. Um, think about great business schools, right? right. Uh, Harvard may come to mind. Yeah. All the buildings at Harvard B School are named after the former treasurers of the United States, except one, James I. Cash Hall. Mm -hmm. Jim Cash was the first African American to uh, faculty member to earn tenure at Harvard Business School. Double boilermaker, mm -hmm. right? Masters in computer science from here, um, PhD from Craner. We are the number one producer of blacks earning PhD degrees in chemistry among Research One institutions, number one in statistics, um, number one in the Big Ten for blacks earning PhDs over the past five years in computer science. Mm -hmm. Your college, engineering technology, mm -hmm. we're number one in the nation enrolling and educating blacks um, among Research One institutions. Telling that story right. is better leverage right. uh, for changing the face um, and the environment of Purdue uh, than, um, you know, associated measures uh, at our peer institutions, right. right? So I want to compare Purdue to Purdue's rich history um, and extraordinary possibility uh, and hold us to a different standard that the nation has not yet met. You know, we were on a call this morning, and you mentioned just a little bit on this cut in response to my last question about HBCUs, which are under the umbrella of MSIs, minority serving institutions. So, what are some best practices we can learn from minority serving institutions that could help us make meaningful progress in the value and practice of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Purdue? Best thing we can learn from HBCUs um, about developing a collective environment is where we started from the top. Uh, a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. HBCUs um, causes one to feel yeah. like they belong. Right. Like not only do they feel it intrinsically, um, but there's the nurturing uh, and not only uh, the possibility, but an expectation yes. uh, of uh, success uh, and of thriving. The focus on a sense of belonging uh, that engenders a personal commitment, a professional commitment, coupled with an institutional commitment to get you there, right? Um, an unwavering um, appreciation for 
individual um, capabilities, right? Irrespective of background. Um, a belief in the dignity uh, of blackness, right? right? Um, I, I remember in this particular moment, Levon, uh, something said to me and to, uh, to many people by John Sylvanus Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, former president of yeah. Morehouse and mm -hmm. uh, former director of the White House mm -hmm. Initiative on HBCUs. He says that when he entered Morehouse, as I did, mm -hmm. Morehouse held a crown over his head yeah. that it challenged him to grow tall enough to wear. Yeah. But when he entered Harvard, Harvard held a question mark over its head that it challenged him to remove. In too much of higher education, particularly um, uh, majority higher education, mm -hmm. there is a big question mark over the heads of uh, black students, mm -hmm. black lives, black scholarship, black dignity, right? right? So whether it's the microaggressions that we hear about, whether it's differential treatment, mm -hmm. um, whether it's uh, um, deficit storytelling, right? right? Um, question mark. Belonging says that the question mark is no longer over my head, but rather a crown, mm -hmm. right? If we can deliver on the promise of the crown, uh, we will have achieved something very, uh, very great. Uh, at Purdue and beyond. So we've, we've talked about many ways we hope to make Purdue better in the future. Um, could you perhaps tell us about one or more ways in which things are better now at Purdue than they were just a few years ago, or for that matter, when you first started your role? That's an interesting question. Okay. I think I can tell you many ways. Right. Right. But what I'd like to do is to ask you, can you tell me one way in which the university is better uh, from the time of uh, my arrival, say 2019, uh, till today? Well, I think clearly for me, I've been here now 14 years uh, for context, just the conversations around DEI and how it's been elevated in the hearts and in the minds of folks and the conversations is something that I see far more often now than when I first started. And that did not occur even prior to when you started, right? So I think for me, that's probably one of the biggest things I would say that I see and feel just being here as a faculty member and now an administrator. Sure. I would say that there is um, uh, the beginnings uh, of an enriched attitude change yeah. uh, at the university yeah. uh, all around, uh, right? Uh, we're not where we want to be, but we're not where we used to be right. uh, either. There is greater resource commitment uh, to DEI work. Uh, the Equity Task Force committed a $75 million um, uh, you know, down payment mm -hmm. uh, on the work that needs to be done. Um, there, is, there are more opportunities for professional development, what uh, some people might call training. Uh, I call professional development. Um, so to further enrich uh, our understanding uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, there are more opportunities to engage in, uh, becoming more opportunities to engage in the life of the university. We are um, beginning to celebrate uh, black faculty yeah. excellence. Yeah. Uh, we'll celebrate black staff excellence. We begin the year, Levon, with something that I don't think has ever happened uh, in the contemporary history of Purdue. Uh, and I say contemporary, meaning the last 50 years. Right. Right. And that is we started the year with a family dinner. Mm -hmm. A family yeah. dinner. Yeah. Um, and this was really about gathering black people uh, and others, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are here roughly 125 or so black faculty, or people that hold some sort of faculty right. rank, right. and about 203 roughly uh, black staff, mm -hmm. right? So uh, 350 right. Uh, black faculty and staff combined out of the many thousands right. uh, that we have. Um, and we are spread hither and yon all over this massive place. Right. Um, 
And many of us don't know each other. Right. People have been here for years, don't right. know each other. Right. We expect that, oh, there's so few, you all have to know each other. No, we don't. Yeah. Right? Right, right, right. We gathered yeah. us uh, this year. Um, at the beginning of the year, over 100 people uh, came. Uh, people saw each other that they hadn't seen in some time. I met people who've been here for 17 years and right. um, uh, hadn't uh, met before. And there's this one thing that happened. I was sitting at a table uh, with a group of folks that included some newcomers. Um, and the uh, director of PUSH uh, was at the table. She's from Nigeria. Mm-hmm. At the next table was uh, Dr. Betty. Uh, from agriculture. Mm -hmm. Um, She's also from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. They hadn't met. Mm -hmm. They met each other uh, at the table there and started chatting. Discovered that not only are they both from Nigeria, they're from the same town in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. They chatted further and discovered it sounds like we're related. Mm -hmm. They called back to Nigeria uh, that night uh, while at the dinner and Mm -hmm. confirmed with their relatives that they in fact are related. Wow. Uh, they found family. Wow. Um, they found community. Mm-hmm. They found a deeper sense of belonging. Mm-hmm. I think those small things, right, like that, uh, are as big as some of the big things mm-hmm. uh, that we do. Uh, and so I see life changing at Purdue. Again, we are not where we want to be right. or right. what we ought to be. Right. But there is movement here Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, for the better, Mm -hmm. uh, I think. uh, And I hope that the university will sustain and grow that over the course of time. So I have one final question. Um, So easy one for you. So is there anything that we didn't talk about uh, that you would like to share? Anything at all? Anything is fair game right now? I, one of the things that I think is important for diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and for people of color uh, and others to be able to do at Purdue to have a sense of belonging is to live out loud, to be able to live affirmatively. Mm -hmm. There is so much about the culture here that um, is embracing, and there's yet too much that is um, not embracing. Right, right. I want, and I do because I am who I am at this point in my life. Right, right. But I want every black person to be able to be here and be proud. Mm-hmm. I want every LGBTQA person um, to find their space, mm-hmm. right? I want our our Jewish uh, friends, our brothers and sisters, uh, to be able to walk in the dignity and the strength of uh, their humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, we say that that's able to happen, right. right? We commit ourselves to that. And yet there are cultural strictures uh, that are not fully affirming uh, of that. I want us to recognize that we are a global university, Mm -hmm. um, not just a university that's in the middle of corn and soybean fields, right? right? I want us to act like it um, and be fully embracing uh, of our uh, individual and collective humanity. I want us to think bigger than uh, we may see to imagine possibilities that um, have not been drawn out, uh, to create um, spaces of fresh. I want us to be alive. Um, I want us to remember our history, right? The richness, the, the depth, and the dignity of our history. Uh, and I want us to create a new history, right? I want us to um, all be participants uh, in this change moment, not simply participant observers, uh, but participants um, in the nurturing of a great university. Purdue has all of the ingredients necessary um, to be triumphant in this space. Um, let's help it get there. Well, thank you, John. This was 
great, great interview. I've learned a lot and um, I think the most appropriate thing to say now is just thank you. Thank for, you very for much. Your, for your work and for your efforts and for being a leader here at Purdue. Thank you.